Hi, I'm Rick Carter, production designer for Star Wars 9, The Rise of Skywalker, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director, a producer, and owner of BC Media Productions. This is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals and filmmakers. Today we speak with Rick Carter, the legendary production designer of films including Avatar, Jurassic Park, Back to the Future 2 and 3, and Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Buy Rent Create at Rule, and Post Lab, stress-free collaboration for Final Cut Pro. Well, we have a legend on Go Creative Show today, Rick Carter production designer of basically every movie ever made. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at his, uh, his work right now on IMDb. Look at this. Jurassic Park, Forrest Gump, Castaway, um, Avatar, um, Back to the Future 2 and 3, Star Wars Episode 7 and Star Wars Episode 9, and so much more. Like, it's, it's mind-boggling, the um, portfolio that Rick Carter has. So you can only imagine the knowledge that uh, is going to be shared today on this episode. And I cannot wait to bring it to you guys. Uh, you're you're going to notice that there's a couple of audience questions in here. And we've been doing this for the past few months. And I love it because you guys, the Go Creative Show audience, you guys are super smart. <laughs> I got to be, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of questions that have come through and I'm like, damn. I wish I thought of that. <laughs> I really do. Um, so we're thankful that you guys have been asking these questions and we're incorporating as many as we can into the show. And it's a great opportunity to have your voice heard. And uh, we give you a little shout out and uh, it's been fun. And I know people have been liking it. So um, here's how you do it. You follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And we let you guys know when we have upcoming guests and give you an opportunity to ask your questions. Then we take those questions, we ask them on the show, give you a little shout out, and everyone is happy. Uh, so please continue to do that if you are already uh, following us on that uh, on those platforms. And if you're not following us yet, why? Why, right? Come on, join us. It's fun. And don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app because that way you're not going to miss an episode. And why would you want to with the type of guests that we've been serving up week after week um, and another great one coming up right now. We've got Rick Carter, the production designer of basically everything, but especially Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker, right here on Go Creative Show. So I'm here with Rick Carter, production designer for Star Wars Episode Nine, but so many other films. <laughs> we are certainly going to get to that. It is amazing the work that you've done in your career and i mean still going strong like this is it's incredible when i look at your uh when your your list of work i mean we're talking about certainly star wars avatar uh, forrest gump jurassic park back to the future two and three i mean wow what a what a get to have you here on go creative show and we're so thankful that you're here with us thank you very much when you pose the question or or the uh broad canvas that you've that you've laid out which for me of course is my lifetime or at least my career um and it's been about 45 years i i do recall it as a, a single trip i mean a, a journey of sorts and that is the motif that i've always uh brought to my work and experienced in my work uh and it's very personal because I started off uh, in my adolescence, my late teens and early 20s, traveling around the world um, in the late 1960s and early 70s. And so when it came time to actually have a career, I really didn't know how I would apply any of that to something that I could do for the next 45 years. Mm. And it turns out that production design for me has been the perfect uh, arena to, to, to work in. And it's Primarily, I think, because there's a, a way that when you create the worlds for movies, there's a way to draw upon your own personal experiences of going to places. And if you have had experiences such as I have in my life where I've had uh, interesting experiences out 
into the world in various foreign places, and I could find a sense of place um, by being there, almost a spirit of place at times, and then try to invoke that when I was designing different worlds in, in various movies so that I'm not only just doing it on a literal level of the, the script at hand or the story, but I'm, I'm invoking sometimes places and, and feelings that I've had uh, in my own life uh, out on the road. So that's kind of a maybe a, an end to the discussion of a broad canvas of, of the, the last 45 years of traveling, not only in real life, but also um, in cinema. And so many of the movies I've done or been asked to work on, and I didn't pick them, they picked me, uh, are journey movies where you really go somewhere and then the drama unfolds as a result of going to a different place. It doesn't always happen in just uh, a single setting, sometimes there's a couple where it's been just a couple of settings and you go deeper and the journey is an interior type of uh, uh, experience. But for me, so many of the movies from Back to the Future and Jurassic Park and Forrest Gump and AI and Avatar and uh, Star Wars movies and BFG and Lincoln, they really uh, take you out into the world. So I guess I just start with that kind of a, a premise and maybe that helps you to um, ask whatever you feel that you'd like to discuss. Well, that's interesting. I, I was kind of curious about how much um, of your research process before you even start anything, how much of that is kind of sitting at your computer, looking up, you know, the, the way things look in different areas of the world or are you at a position now where you can sort of demand as part of your budget uh, the ability to go and travel places, take your own photos, sketch your own sketches, be in those environments and feel them? Like, uh, what is your process in the very, very early pre-production? Well, actually, in a, in, a, in a strange way, it's both of those things that on one hand, I, in reading the script and talking to the directors, I, I usually am, am very attuned to what's the metaphor that they are invoking in their story and the personal reasons that they're telling the story. So because I've worked uh, for 20 years, the first 20 years was just with Steven Spielberg and, and uh, Bob Zemeckis. So I got to know them quite well. And the dialogue that we would have as to why we were telling the story uh, was very personal to them. So first of all, I could, I could get to a personal level and an emotion that they were trying to convey through the story that they were telling. The second part is that uh, there are budgets enough for me to be the person who not only goes on the computer now and researches um, and does my own sketches, along with, of course, illustrators making them look much better than mine do, mm. um, but also to go out into the world. And it's almost like I feel at times I'm auditioning locations to be in a movie and trying to be as economical as I can uh, and strategic so that we can make the movie not only for the price, but also in an efficient way. And that takes me to uh, many places sometimes on movies, uh, especially something like Munich, where it was all practically uh, locations, but then to try to simplify the vision of what that series of locations were into maybe two or three hubs where we could still get everything that we were trying to do, but then invoke places that I had visited or that were historically correct that because of the research that I was able to do. So I feel like, you know, you get a lot from the experience of being at these places like that. You, you sort of, I actually saw in one of the interviews that I looked at sort of prepping for this is that for Avatar, you were inspired by the ocean and you seem to get inspiration from things that people may not necessarily connect with the movie so much. Um, so my question is, and I'm, what I'm most curious about is, when you first get a script, it, what is the first step to um, creating this new world? Like, are there, are there questions that you ask a director every time? Are there things about the script that you look for and, and pull out? What is that early inspiration? I think the first the first uh, step is to read the script or hear the ideas because sometimes there hasn't been a script when I've started. Oh, so you're um, that early on sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. But, uh, when we were doing 
uh, for instance, well, the, even the Star Wars, The Force Awakens, or the most the latest one, I was on as the script was being developed, as the story was being developed. And then I'm asked to uh, bring a visual point of reference to what is being discussed, but it's beyond just illustrating the ideas that are coming up that are coming out of the uh, the writer and the director. It's more that many times the visual is the idea. So for instance, uh, if you think about The Force Awakens and you ask yourself the question, and this doesn't quite get to the overall, except for I would just say, I let it wash over me, whatever the idea or whatever the script is, and don't try to pick it apart as much as try to feel it. So in The Force Awakens, one of the questions that I was asking when I first started on the Star Wars project, even before JJ was there, was how strong is the Force? What, what's the purpose of telling these Star Wars movies now? Uh, and so I actually asked uh, a group of uh, illustrators who I called visualists up at Lucasfilm, how strong is the Force? And you can't just answer that with words. You have to show it. You yeah, have to yeah. actually depict, like, where can this all go? Now, we came to a specific place where I asked a question of a group of people, uh, and this is kind of, I guess, the way I do it in a collaborative way, is, is I don't have just my own interior process. I have a collaborative process that I often try to guide and be also receiving of people's ideas in a very collaborative way. Um, so I asked uh, a group of people, what would actually scare you about the return of the dark side? Like, what, what could they do that would actually be truly threatening? And it was Dennis Mirren, uh, the visual effects guru who was in the meeting, who said, well, if the dark side could take the light out of a star, then that would be very, very powerful because there it's Star Wars and taking the light out of the sky. And then J.J. really liked that idea. And he turned, he sort of weaponized that so that uh, that became the threat that is in the movie. So it's the, that is the whole underlying uh, threat that the dark side is, is going to uh, enact um, in the movie. And that's the kind of thing, uh, or in this latest Star Wars movie, I was looking at the uh, Star Destroyer, and there were some there were some illustrations we were doing, and I just thought, wouldn't it be great to stage some kind of a swashbuckling, uh, even like a Western scene on top of a Star Destroyer? Because it's it's always been thought of in Star Wars language from the beginning that it was a Western in space. So that's what led to, for instance, the cavalry charge coming. Uh, to the rescue and th at the end of the movie, that kind of thinking, now those are action sequences. Sometimes it's um, a very, uh, what's the word, uh, more essential or basic level, such as in Forrest Gump, realizing the importance of that home and how the home that he lived in, that boarding house, would never change, even though he would travel out and have all these experiences. but the home that was represented, it's like the idea that, that Dorothy goes on her journey, but she goes back to Kansas now and again uh, throughout her journey and touches that, that base as it changes very little other than that's where he experiences the loss of his, you know, his mother and his, his uh, girlfriend and wife, uh, Jenny. Mm. That's a kind of an emotional metaphor that I could tap into and understand that that was at the heart of Forrest Gump and that as a character, Forrest is not supposed to be a smart person. They even show, We even show you a little graph as though it was made for him by the principal to show you how dumb he is. Or he doesn't quite make it. And yet he never does anything stupid in the whole movie. He's always following his heart. So it's kind of a MacGuffin that's at the center of the movie that is not actually true. Meaning he isn't actually stupid. He even says, you know, I, I, I um, may not be a smart man, but I know what love is. And he always is following that. So then that type of feeling can lead to the type of decision making where we, we wrapped a lot of scenes that were supposed to be out in the town and various other places into that oak alley that led to the house. And then even just building the house right where we did um, with the tree framing it for me it was a way to invoke Tara 
uh, in that was in um, Gone with the Wind, because that's the framing of that old Southern story, which has many similarities. Where it's, it's a Southern story, the United States, and uh, the world is sort of torn apart by by a civil war, which is in a sense what was happening in the late 60s, early 70s to America. And that was a movie that we were creating, in a sense, I think Bob felt this, to try to be healing from from those divisions that had occurred. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. (laughs) Do you look for those kind of locations or sets in all of your films, like those places that we can keep going back to throughout the film that may have, you know, uh, a different meaning for the cast or even the audience as the story progresses? If if the story allows for the person to go back, now sometimes it doesn't. For instance, uh, although ultimately it does at the end, uh, the movie uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Once he is thrown out of his home, then he goes to a series of places. Those were all laid out by Stanley Kubrick. Now he does return home at the end, and as you notice, that's in, that's in his imagination to to. Uh, be with his mother and to experience her love for him. All of these stories, if you can kind of imagine, same thing with Back to the Future 2, uh, even Jurassic Park and certainly Avatar um, and BFG, they're very much like The Wizard of Oz. And, and so the structure of the journey motif is something I experienced in real life as a young man then also had a structure of the journey motif from the movies and the reading I've done in my life. Uh, That allows me an insight sometimes to these movies where, for instance, on Avatar, I, I saw that as The Wizard of Oz meets Apocalypse Now. Those are both journey movies. It sounds crazy, but... It actually isn't, uh, and I laid that out in a in a whole room that Jim came in and could see the thoughts I had about not only the progression of his movie, but the various levels that the movie goes to. That, in some ways, they are like the Wizard of Oz, in some ways even beyond. So that there is a Kansas in that movie, which is the Hell's Gate uh, base on Pandora, where the humans live. And in fact, even in the the initial script, and it's in the extended DVD, there's uh, scenes on Earth. Um, but that's a human environment. Then you, he, once he takes the Avatar state, he actually goes out into the world of Pandora. But he comes back and forth. and he, So he not only has his human existence as Jake Sully, who is a twin, but he has a singular experience, uh, existence, excuse me, as the avatar who goes out into home tree and then uh, the, the well of souls. And that kind of an experience of, of journeying out from a home base is very similar uh, to the wizard of Oz, but it even goes to another dimension, which is the bioluminescent dimension, which Jim described as phantasmagoric, which even in a sense goes beyond Oz. It's into a dream state. That's what phantasmagoric means. And that's what he had experienced at the bottom of the ocean when he was doing the Titanic uh, movies, deep diving as he does in real life. He saw forms of life, the bioluminescent forms of life at the bottom of the ocean. And he brought back that as the idea that he wanted to convey about what the world really is naturally and how connected everything is, even on a consciousness level. Does that make sense? It, I'm, it I'm does. To... It, what I kind of thought, what, <laughs> what I got out of that bioluminescent sort of feel is almost like, you know, the humans, us on Earth, we always try to kind of create these sort of lit environments, these like New York City, places like, you know, Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, big cities that are intriguing and interesting and draw you in through their sort of lightscapes. Um, but naturally, these things happen too. And I think that's what's so interesting about that bioluminescent sort of feel. Um, am I going down the right road? Was there something like that in the discussions? Well, it wasn't exactly like that, but it parallels it. And I'll tell you the version that I think is is similar. Um, there's two journeys going on in that movie. Uh, there's Jake Sully's uh, individual um, exploration of his identity where he's literally put into another state 
uh, that he ends up actually abandoning his human state in favor of. But there's also um, Sigourney Weaver's uh, character, Grace, who's a scientist. So if, if you take a look at the things that she is exploring with her scientific uh, uh, technological instruments, she, or even when you see the, the, the process of Jake becoming able to transfer into his uh, avatar state, it, it looks like graphs that look very much like the bioluminescence. And we did that on purpose so that what we we're trying to do was convey that there were two parallel paths going on. One was scientific and one was, in a sense, more spiritual mm. uh, or character driven in the sense that you think about it. Jake Sully is a is a not even a he's a cripple in real life and he ends up becoming a leader. Uh, the first thing he does is run around uh, when he's in his avatar state. But he has to develop into that leader. Grace has been developing from her science base some of the same observations about nature. And in a way, that's the way we we can look at things. It's not quite where you went, which is to say we then can, in our own way, create that imagery and are attracted to creating that imagery. You know, the, the let there light be light, even in darkness, is obviously a very fundamentally um, powerful image for us to to want to create and then now disney you know making the avatar park in animal kingdom um you know to see your work realized in a physical way that now people can actually walk through i mean what does that feel like well it's it's quite amazing i've had that experience never quite to the extent that 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 world is of course um but to have a notion of something that I'm involved in with the directors and the, and, and the producers and all of the incredible number of people who work on these movies uh, and see them then realized as places that people can go visit on their own, uh, you know, whether it's Back to the Future or the War of the Worlds uh, settings in, in um, uh, at Universal or yeah. um, uh, the Star Wars parks, you know, at, at Disneyland, uh, or as you say, the Avatar Park. One of the things that it makes me think, and this is this has been over the years, I've, I've sort of developed this idea about moviescapes, that that you can go to some of these worlds, even if it's not the physical manifestation as a ride, um, and Jurassic Park is one of those as well, of course. Um, but if you think about it, you can go into the worlds of the movies and not have the same narrative, nor be have the same characters. And that is, I think, something that's relatively new. It, it's certainly been there always. I mean, going into Oz without Dorothy and a different uh, narrative is possible in yeah. people's minds. But I think it's now being taken into the real world through this other form of, of entertainment and amusement parks. That's very interesting to me because it, it is a breakdown of sorts under this sort of guise of, the, of, of what is the world and I call it a movie escape because it's like great. It's a movie escape that you go into in the movies, but then you want more of it. And that's why there could be sequels. They're not always as good, but but they are they're an attempt to take you back, you know, into that uh, place that you uh, wanted to go to uh, again because you got something out of it the first time. And again, that's very much in sync with the journey motif when you when you have an experience of a journey that matters where you're not just a tourist, you're and not to, you're a traveler. What you're looking for happen is some form of an epiphany as to why you took the journey to begin with that leads to a form of a catharsis. And a catharsis then makes you feel like you're purposeful and your life is in sync with with uh, your life and times and your interior uh, desire to have meaning. And all that sounds very, you know, almost existentially highfalutin. But I'm certainly of a generation uh, that's been doing this for a long time in seeking a kind of transcendent experience. You know, for me, it probably started with the Beatles and and John Lennon and his his music in particular uh, that that inspired my whole first journey to the East when I went to India in 1970. Mm. And it was to find a different way of thinking, a different paradigm shift. And that, I think, is reflected in almost every single movie that I've worked on. And that, that I feel 
very, very good about because, again, I'm not directing those stories. I'm, those stories have come to me to help uh, be a guide on and to help realize the vision that directors have. But, of course, I've had experiences with such amazing directors so that they always make whatever I do better. And so I'm not one of those people that says, oh, I wish I could have done this or that. I don't have that experience even once in any of the movies. Some of the movies are more successful than others, but they're all born out of a, a legitimate sense of, of, of I, I suppose, this an authentic quest to, to provide vision to, to stories that I think are worthy and that maybe communicate out into the world certain values. Do you have a preference uh, for the style of film that you're doing and the style of production design that you're doing? Um, do you like, like something more grounded in reality, you know, with like, you know, Castaway and Lincoln and Forrest Gump, or do you kind of like things where you've completely create the world? Like, like we were talking about avatar and AI and things like that. I mean, you've done so much of it. Um, I'm curious if you have a preference. I think it's, I, I've I always tried to emulate what it would be like, uh, to be George Martin with the Beatles. And that is to that is to say, to be around such genius talent that wherever it takes you, it's always fresh and new, and you apply the same basic level of, of uh, curiosity and inquisitiveness and inventiveness, but that where it takes you can be very eclectic. And sometimes it can be um, very reality-based, and then sometimes it's absolutely fanciful. But I'm not sure that I always know the difference. That's a weird thing to say. Hmm. But because I I don't I don't apply different standards, I, I I it's all an illusion to some degree. And then some illusions other people know more about going in. So you have to hit points of reference that they will believe take them into a time period or to a place. Um, and I enjoy that kind of uh uh, research and I enjoy that type of recreation, but being able to do both and some movies that are sort of a hybrid, which has been a lot of that too, um, or twisting the reality, such as in the Back to the Future movies, um, I find that to be very invigorating. That that I've been able to have it so uh, mixed up from from movie to movie and back to back. Sometimes they parallel, uh, and that the movies I can make associations from one to another. Um, such as AI being about a little boy going into the ice to find himself. And then the next movie was the Polar Express. Yeah. And it was kind of the same movie by these two directors who I knew very well. Uh, and they were kind of like having Steven Spielberg as an older brother and uh, Bob Zemeckis as a younger brother who had a desire to go back and re uh, discover some of the basic uh emotions of their childhoods and wanting to be able to believe. For Stephen, it was going through Stanley Kubrick's desire to do that and to tell a story about the, the nature of, of what it is to be loved and to feel that you are an authentic, real human being or boy. Mm. Uh, and then the same thing is very close in, in the Polar Express where Bob Zemeckis was, after Castaway, in a sense, reinvigorating his life by looking back and rediscovering his fate and his faith was in cinema in the digital form, that it was a new uh, area to, for him to explore. But he used the metaphor of Christmas to, to be able to discover, you know, in a sense, a literal uh, ticket to ride uh, that was a, a, a cinematic trip. And both of those are very uh, extensive journey movies, of course. And I think it was interesting that they both uh, did those sort of back to back. And then I got to have a, a double kind of experience of, of, of that in the middle of my life. I mean, it's, it was, I was just around 50 years old uh, on either side when I experienced that. And I think that's not unusual for people in their, when they turn 50 to start to reflect back to their childhoods to see where they came from. Mm. This message is for all of you Final Cut Pro 10 users. I've got huge news and a huge offer for you from PostLab. Now, PostLab is a collaboration tool for Final Cut Pro 10, and it enables users to share libraries, 
track and save your changes, and to make sure that no more than one person is working on the library simultaneously. So that means zero conflicts, plus a recallable history of your project. Now, PostLab is a cloud service, but it's also a desktop app. And what I mean by that is this. PostLab allows you to work off a local copy. So it's just like when you're working without PostLab. You don't need to change your workflow, right? Because there's always a full local copy of your library right there. Now, if for some reason your library is not on your computer, that's fine because PostLab will download it first. It wants you to be working locally. So even though it's a cloud service, you're not working from the cloud. So it's preventing any sort of speed issues you may run into. They're all gone. And also, PostLab runs on its own cloud purposely built for libraries. Purposely built. Now, if you've used Final Cut Pro 10 and you've shared libraries across other sort of -of run-of-the-mill cloud services, you know that it doesn't really work that well. That's not the case with PostLab. PostLab is bulletproof, and it is exactly what you need. Um, Aside from all of that, they have incredible collaboration. So within a library, within a production, collaborators can set up and assign tasks. You can comment on changes and set statuses for your library. There is so much there to explore, and I know you guys are going to love it. It's a must-have tool. Now, here's the great news. You're going to get three months free simply by going to gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. Three free months. Absolutely, this is a no-brainer. If you're using Final Cut Pro 10, you have to be using PostLab. They're going to give you three months free just for being Go Creative Show listeners. How about that? GoCreativeShow.com forward slash PostLab. I want to talk about um, Star Wars a little bit. Uh, You've worked on Episode 7 and Episode 9, I'd love to know kind of what it's like to, you know, thinking about back to episode seven, this is the, it's not necessarily a reboot, but you're once again, bringing star Wars back into the zeitgeist, bringing it back to, you know, a younger generation. So you're, you're in effect sort of recreating how the younger and next generation is going to have a first star Wars movie experience. Um, what does that feel like? And what sort of pressures does that put on you? Because I was, uh, see, I was 27 when Star Wars came out in 1977. I would already been around the world twice. And then, so I wasn't seeing it like J.J. Abrams as an 11-year-old. And mm. so what was interesting for me was I felt like I was one of the elders because I was actually already older than Alec Guinness was when he played uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm. So... I, I looked at the whole process as very much a transition from a, from one generation to another, trying to um, express what we had discovered, but also so that you could move it forward into the future. And ironically, if you just hear what I just said, it's like going back to the future, meaning I went back in order to go forward. <laughs> and... Um, so that is a motif that, of course, actually Bob had had been influenced by the original Star Wars movies to experience because, remember, it started with number four. So yeah. what happened to one, two, and three? You know, the whole thing became out of time, yeah. right? And then that's, of course, the basis of the Back to the Future trilogy. So for me, that was part of what I was trying to convey, and, and and in a sense, I was trying to ask that fundamental question, not about the force as something separate, only about Star Wars, but what is, number one, the force? <clears throat> and Steven Spielberg would say and has said to me that he, he feels that uh, the force is, is intuition, that, that how intuition plays a role in his life, he would regard as the force. And if you think about it, that kind of a, uh, put aside the, the the things that are telling you what it's supposed to be, but see what it is. That was what I was trying to to help people who are younger come in and experience for the first time, and then take on a responsibility to confront the darkness if it should uh, arise again, as it did, and that you would find that that much of the darkness is not just out there. But there is, it is in your own heart. And to be able to make a transformation to actually 
uh, confront the darkness that's within you as well so that you can find a way from the inside to deal with it as Luke had to and as Ray had to and as Ben uh, Solo did as, as Kylo Ren. I thought those were worthy themes given any time really, but particularly our times now. And it was great to be there in the beginning for the first one. I then had a number of consultations with Ryan Johnson uh, before he made his movie. And I know how personal that imagery is to him, just as I know how personal the imagery uh, is for uh, JJ. And I can convey some of that. Um, But one thing I would like to say, just by bringing up both JJ and Ryan, is that that was part of the whole message was come in to this world that Kathy Kennedy and Disney were, were creating for directors and storytellers to tell a version of the story that's personal to you because it was very personal to George, the way yeah. he uh, created that world and all those stories. So Ryan, of course, took the story that J.J. had laid out to a different place and in a different direction. But if you think about it, he, he, he I think, created a masterful second act. First of all, he got a tremendous number of people to reevaluate some of the the givens that they thought that they knew, some people didn't like that, but a lot of people uh, were very invigorated, particularly the critics. So, what did he do? He 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 took the thing that supposedly mattered so much, the Excalibur uh, symbol, the lightsaber, and the first thing that Luke did was take it and sort of seemingly throw it away, right? What he was trying to do, like a <clears throat> Uh, you know, a, a Zen monk would do back in the day, or still, is to say your preconceptions that you're walking into this with need to be put aside so you can see what really uh, is important. And he was not even sure, Luke wasn't himself, what was actually important. She was part of the catalyst for him determining what was important. But if you realize by the end of the movie how powerful that lightsaber has become, then that's because Ryan was able to strip it all down and then bring it back. So you had a few things to work with. That was one of them, the lightsaber. But he had taken away many of the other things that you would want to assume that you would always have. Now, of course, it went further than that in real life because Carrie Fisher passed away, and that was devastating to how could she now be in the next movie if she wasn't here? And then J.J. uh, made it very, very clear that it was important to him that she be an anchor for that final movie because it was her journey, if you think about it, from the very beginning that has been the really long journey that has gone through so much. If you think about the the heroine's journey, it's one thing to think about Ray and, and the first 30 years of her life. But what Leia has gone through from being a a princess and a lover and a general and a mother and losing her son and then taking on this other woman, a young girl who doesn't know who she is and trying to guide her and then and then reaching out at the end to stop her son from dying in that way and being healed by the woman so that she can pass as Obi-Wan Kenobi did uh, and have had a fulfilled life. That kind of thing was there in the beginning for J.J., it was there for Ryan, and it was there at the end even after... Um, Carrie Fisher had passed away, and yet she, there she was in the movie. And that was very personal for J.J. and Ryan. Both of them have very, very strong uh, relationships with their mothers and and are honoring those relationships in the movies that you see. Obviously, Stanley Kubrick and Steven Spielberg had the same. That's in AI, in, in full display. The, the love of a mother, the the... the the woman's uh, not just young journey, which is nothing wrong with that. That's why you want to convey that to a younger audience. Sure. So you can start on a journey. But if you get to be older and you're looking at your life, some of these more uh, rich experiences that are very hard to go through at times, but those those provide for a real lifetime. And I think that's all in the Star Wars movies that are there, all three of them. And I think that the fact that that at the end of number eight, you're left with a situation where supposedly Ray is confronted what Ryan said was her worst situation of being nobody. Well, JJ said 
themselves, that's not as bad as it can get. As bad as that is for a second act, what if she has to confront that the darkness is in her and that she's connected to it and has to find a different path forward? I thought that was entirely on a journey in the big scope of those three movies, a wonderful uh, progression. And I, I'm sorry that people feel like they need to take one or the other side. And I'm hoping over time that what people see is it is quite a coherent and I think invigorating journey. I think JJ, if he had done all three, would not have probably uh, gone as far in the second act to creating a situation where, you know, the call went out, nobody answered. There's 14 people in Millennium Falcon. Ray is nobody. Uh, Luke is gone. And now, uh, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, if you think about what would you do to make a Star Wars number nine after that, it was a daunting task, but it was a it was a good task. It was the right task. People, yes, they didn't know all the answers, but they knew a lot and they knew what they wanted it to feel like. And the Kathy Kennedy was very, very uh, good, as was Michelle Rejwan, the other producer, in guiding this towards what it became, which I think is is a trilogy that fits within the other nine as one big story. And as somebody from my age, I can say that I, I very much related uh, to the, what was being told. I want to talk for a few minutes about creating planets for Rise of Skywalker. And we have an audience question, uh, Nick Field 90 on Twitter. He wants to know if you can walk us through your experience creating uh, Palpatine's lair on Exegol. That's interesting, obviously, um, because how... Palpatine's lair on Exegol came into creation uh, took quite a while. We knew that we wanted to have him uh, be in a state that was one that you could kind of believe uh, he'd been through something. Because obviously, the last time we saw him, he was thrown down that long shaft and we presumed he was dead. So he was he was brought back in a, in a form that was not quite fully human because he was he was so augmented with all these other uh, uh, you know technological kind of apparatuses. But what was more important to me was that it's a mirror image of sorts of the two old temples, one being uh, on Skellig Island where Luke is, which is a real place in in off the coast of Ireland. And that that's where he went as a retreat, where the Jedi Order would have first come into being and be the 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 place as it really is in real life, as a Christian uh, monastery of of 500 BC, uh, or excuse me, AD. Um, Exegol was for me, and the place that we went to take our inspiration from was actually Petra in Jordan, which is something that is ancient to a place as a place where the emperor in whatever form he was would have been returned there to reconstitute his abilities and his ability specifically of course to to project into the world through snoke and all the various ways that he's been doing it over the years but that that comes from an ancient place and so that's why what you see is this overscale kind of sith temple um, that is a lightning planet because that's you know something we associate deeply with uh, the emperor is his ability to use the force in a, with the, with the lightning, and so there was also an idea that JJ wanted to have the confrontation between Palpatine and Ray be in front of an audience of his followers because if he was going to be offering her that throne, then and she accepted it, then that would mean, by striking him down, then that would mean that all those people were now in on that. It's like a a, a Nuremberg rally on a spiritual level, that, that she would be consumed by the, uh, the Sith darkness. And so that's what led to the idea that there was a place where everybody was congregated and you could still open up and see up into the heavens where you could see the battle that was going on above um, with the Star Destroyers and all of the fleet that had arrived. But what was also interesting to me was that Ray from there 
had access through all of that to go all the way up. And, and what you end up doing when she's looking up there is going past all the mayhem and going just to the very essence. It's the first image you ever see in Star Wars is that star field. And she goes back to that in order to get the messages from all the Jedi who've ever come before to empower her to take this battle one last level uh, to Palpatine. And rather than being actually where she's bringing her own power to strike him down, which is what he was asking for, she's actually using all of that as a resistance to his power that literally bounces it back onto him. So he's actually destroyed by his own negativity, just reflected back onto him, which ends up imploding and destroying him, all of his followers, and all of the temple. But it was a lot of trying to come up with simple shapes. Kevin Jenkins, the co-designer, did just infinite numbers of of sketches that were wonderful to try to get at this. We had a a number of uh, artists work on this. And finally, it became a, a, a relatively simple sort of temple with 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 that you know elevated design that jj actually i think came up with um and then down underneath the the into the layer being something that i think it just invoked an ancient place that that the sith had originated and gotten their power from and, and we went to petra in jordan as inspiration for that There is still so much to get to with Rick Carter. But before we get there, I want to talk about Rule Boston Camera. Now, Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment for a couple of reasons. One, they have a world-class inventory of rental gear accumulated uh, over the 35 years that they've been in business. Um, We're talking cameras, audio, lighting, grip gear, communication, camera dynamics, everything you want is there. In fact, when big giant Hollywood films come into town, which they do often, they use rule, right? There. That just goes to show you right there. So you have an incredible inventory. But then on top of that, they have the best service in the business. They understand that production is mission critical. They understand that you need a partner in your production. So they're going to make sure that you have expert advice and counsel in pre-production. You're going to get technical guidance when you take the equipment out for your shoot, and they are committed to support you the whole time you have their equipment. So we're talking about peace of mind, right? Every minute is valuable in production. These are expensive days, people, right? Rule Boston Camera is your production partner. That's why we love them. So check them out for yourself and experience the Rule way at rule.com, R-U-L-E dot com. When you first start a project and, you know, as production designer, you're involved intimately very early on. I mean, we've talked to cinematographers that tell us that you know, by the time they're involved, there could be years of development uh, mm-hmm. that the production designer is involved in. Um, and I don't think a lot of people necessarily know that. Um, but that aside, when you begin a project, who is the first, what is the first role that you fill on your team? Who's the next person you engage with to get the ball rolling? Usually uh, some form of an illustrator uh, or illustrators, a group of illustrators, sometimes art directors and location uh, scouts to go out if we, if we need to, to know how to anchor the, the movie right away. Uh, that's why it depends how fantastic the imagery is. You, you need much more illustration if you're going to create a world from scratch than if you're going to go look for it and then uh, actually adapt it for the movie. Yeah. So, um, one of the interesting things about production design is I have no by the numbers uh, process because I, especially the way it's gone with all the international travel, I just get dropped into a place. I have to pull together a team, often of people that I don't know, oh. and so I don't I don't come with my group into a situation. I might know some people, but more and more, very few that I've ever worked with before. So my first job is to is to locate people that I think I can relate to, will be on the, the wavelength, uh, have an enthusiasm and an inspiration, and of course, you know, the chops to pull it off. But basically the idea is it's like coming to a place, again, on that journey level, 
Who am I actually encountering? Who can I work with? And the collaborative process is so important to me. I I'm not a one man band. I'm I'm a I'm somebody who uh, needs not only the, the the genius of the directors, uh, but I also need uh, close to genius from all the people that I get to hire and work with, from illustrators and set decorators and art directors, of course the visual effects uh, gurus that I don't hire but I get to work with, and I've done that with some of the best people ever. Oh yeah. Um, I I feel like that the strength of production design is in the understanding of how collaborative the process has to be. And when there's nothing there, how much you have to create with a team that puts it in front of everybody else so that they have what Bob Zemeckis would call their marching orders. They can see it. They know what the plan is. You've helped to design the production, not just on the visual side, but where it's going to be shot, how it's going to be shot. And then you, Fill it in with 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 things that that the director um, thinks is are are is going to be a great setting and a, and it has good ideas behind it, and then everybody else can then amplify that. But when that's not there, when there's nothing there and it's a blank canvas, there's a lot of ways of looking at a blank canvas. You can look at it as nothing, or you can look at it as as everything, meaning like white light that has all the colors. And Bob Semeckis used to talk about having a whiteout when he got the sort of flash of what the whole movie would be. Mm. And then he had to discern it from that and pull it into reality by examining all the parts. But one of the, the aspects of production design is there's often so little going on. Uh, not Again, the writers are, are paramount and the producers for getting it all together and giving you the, the basis and usually a, a great script if you're, if you're fortunate. Yeah, how do you mean but, so little going on? In what, in what way? Well, because as on Star Wars or on, I'll uh, say the Polar Express where there was the book, but that's all there was, or in, or in um, Jurassic Park when we're trying to take those types of images that are in the book, but we don't know how we can possibly do it, and the computer-generated dinosaurs have never been done before, and no one's even thought of it when I was starting. So we're trying to, to figure out with, there's a story and there's an idea but that the visual component is helping to de- determine what the story becomes. Yeah. And I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody else that they can contribute. It's about orchestrating all of that so that when the, the crew can come on, then they know what the foundation is, then they can do their job. Um, and a cinematographer, I've always thought, is, is the, for me, other than the director, is the person I have to absolutely relate to because whatever we're going to come up with, they have to be able to, like, if, if I'm imagining things that don't exist, they're imagining those things now existing, but in such a way that they can shoot them and the graphic image and the lighting can all work and that there's a, a visual philosophy behind it that is true to what they can do, want to do, and it's in sync with the director. So that that's a huge collaboration. Yeah, I can only imagine that your ideas kind of start big and then get refined over, you know, it gets more and more refined as you incorporate new departments like cinematography, wardrobe, all that kind of stuff. Well, they're big. Uh, they get bigger. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah, because because reality rather than a lot of people say reality imposes a tyranny that makes you compromise and that many directors will tell you that's how they feel compared to what's in their head and writers what they've written, imagined, and then what is on the screen at the end. That's not my experience. My experience is that I start with something that's hopefully strong enough that inspires people and, and invokes other people's levels of inspiration to come to it. And then it becomes bigger than some of its parts, if you're lucky, at the end. And you just look at it and you wonder how it got created. Because it it's, it's not... It's certainly from my vantage point, it's not mine by the time it's out there in the movie. Yeah. It, it's it's something I've contributed to, but it's the process that I find to be not just invigorating, but essential to making movies more than than they would be. Uh, there's a, a funny story with, with Jim Cameron, who is so talented, as all these guys are, but I mean, his, he can, you know, he can draw, he can 
to he can write. He, he he's he's a great editor. He's a great cameraman. He's been an art director uh, for Roger Corman. So one time he was he was uh, trying to convey something, and he just sort of said something like, "God, you know, I I can do everybody's job here better than they can." And I laughed, and I said, "Yeah, but why do you think there's so much for everybody here to do?" <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of looked at me like, well, what? And what are you saying? And I'm saying, and I explained this, that you could be in your basement trying to make one movie for your entire lifetime. It would never be as good as any of these. So you have to, because of the, the expansiveness of his vision, involve a lot of people and learn to work through many, many people. And that's kind of something I've felt that all the directors that I've worked with have been very, very good at, is that... They're not territorial. Even I mean, Jim Cameron is—he's always open to a better idea. It's just he's got very many good ideas. But so does Steven Spielberg. So does Bob Zemeckis. So does Zack Snyder. So does J.J. Abrams. These people are major brain powers when it comes to cinema. But they also know how important it is to have other people around them contribute, so that it becomes bigger than just what they uh, would do. And also, then that means that the next step that they get to take off from is that much further along. So for instance, in the collaborative process, uh, in the best ways, and again, that goes back to John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr. uh, If you imagine them always making it better, um, Bob Zemeckis, when I would talk with him sometimes in the beginning and do a kind of visual reconnoiter of some idea that I might have for something, uh, you know, and, and throw it out to him, whether it's through an image or through a sentence or whatever I'm saying. And I, over and over again, he would, he would, his eyes would bug out. And he would say things like, well, what I thought you were going to say is, and then he would come up with a whole sequence based upon what we were talking about. Wow. That would go right in the movie as is. And I would say to him, well, now, were you thinking about that? Before I started talking, he said, no, no, that just all sort of came as you were talking, but he's using my energy to go somewhere else that is inspired by that level, but then it's all can be the one that he's thinking about. So the transference there is making it something that, that, that the energy level of the conversation and the inspiration becomes almost as important as the specifics. You obviously, you have to get to the specifics. But these guys are so good at coming up with specifics. It's about hitting the right level. So for me, that that kind of freed me from feeling like I had to be right. I just had to come up with things that I believed in, that I cared about, that would stimulate the conversation. And with, uh, you know, Jim Cameron, he would say, I don't know what you just said, but it, I like that we're getting so much done. So, <laughs> and then Steven Spielberg would say things like, uh, you know, uh, I hear what you're saying. Now say that again. And I'd say something and then uh, have a slightly different take on it, whatever it was, um, trying to get it closer into a zone where I thought he would get it. And then he would go, hmm. And I, and then as he'd say like, hmm, I'd say, well, I think you're about to have a great idea. And he'd say, what do you mean? And I, and I go, I'd say something. And then, he w- and then he would say something in return. And I'd say, see, and it was a great idea. So I was kind of playing with them because I wasn't trying to be right. I was just trying to 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 guide and and be a part of that interaction with him that took it to somewhere that then a great idea comes out. And that's for me that's what production designing is. It's setting the stage for and then it's not just a scene, it's dot dot dot, the whole movie, a specific just being a part of that which gets the movie into a collaborative level that people make it better and better. And there's so many talented people now that you can work with. It's just, can you guide them and keep them all working in the same you know, direction? And I know I'm speaking more generally than I am specifically, uh, but that's because I've been doing this for 45 years. And lots of people can tell you about lots of specific things that they do as a production designer. And I can do that. You know, I can say that in Munich, we put the color red before every murder. So it was a part of the scene and it's in the, and those are, those are aesthetic choices that, that I'm playing out and enjoying doing with the costume designer or whoever. But for me, what really interests me are these bigger 
levels of contribution to the filmmaking process. I can tell. I mean, I, I, you know, we've had production designers on in the past and we've gotten really nitty gritty on color choices, fabric choices, things like that. And, um, to be honest with you, I, I thought that our conversation could, could go down that road because it's been like that with other production designers, but I like where you're taking it. I mean, you're keeping it, you're, you're speaking from a perspective of someone who's just worked on so many projects that are just massive. I mean, your, your portfolio is, I mean, everyone is envious of this portfolio, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear where you kind of land on your thoughts on your entire career and how you approach, you know, films like, like you well, worked on Star Wars and Wicked. But just, I, I wanted to, I heard you in an interview say something that I thought was really interesting and I wanted you to elaborate on it here on the show. Um, you'd said, it's very important not to know what you're doing. <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I'd love to know, first of all, do you even remember saying that or was it just sure. this piece of genius that fell out? Um, but but yeah, I mean, what does that mean? It seems almost, uh, it's it seems like the complete opposite of what, I would think a production designer would say, because I feel like the production designer steers the ship in, in a way that the director does, you know? Yes. Um, I do remember saying that. And I, 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 um, I, I, I kind of, um, and it's reminding me of, of George Harrison in the, in the anthology, uh, of the Beatles. And he had this line, he said, you know, really all you need is love and I'm sticking to it. Mm-hmm. And what I'm saying here is that you, you adapt yourself to the situation that you're in, but to not know is to open yourself up to a possibility of discovering something that nobody else has ever done before. Mm-hmm. Bob Zemeckis would always say, if somebody uh, would refer to another movie the way something was done, and he would say, if we're going to do it just like that, then anybody can do it. Because once that's out there in the world, anybody can copy it. Um, so I think that the idea of not knowing, obviously, if you don't know how to do anything or very much, that can be a dangerous situation. Of course. You know, I mean, a a cinematographer not knowing how a camera works (laughs) is not a good, uh, not a good situation. (laughs) Well, you've given a lot of hope to people that don't know what they're doing in this episode. (laughs) I think, I think that what I'm, yeah. And and to all of you out there, uh, don't try this at home. No, I, I, (laughs) no, I think what I'm trying to say is. I've always tried to identify where I really am. And I always have so many questions. And I know specifically Steven Spielberg, and we've had many conversations about this, he's always afraid of the movies that he takes on. And he's said to me, I don't think I could do a movie that I wasn't afraid of because it wouldn't get his blood going the same way. Mm. And he looks for that that kind of... Uh, that jolt to his system, so he can't just he can't just finesse the situation as he did the last time, and it just becomes your shtick over time. Um, I think that the the aspect of that that I was trying to convey, uh, of course, it's a little bit like you know a, a Zen Cohen kind of thing that those uh, Eastern religion people would say. Something doesn't seem to make sense, but maybe it does. What I was trying to get at is that each time. I find that I've got so many questions and actual, I wouldn't call them fears, but I know I have to discover a process. So when I, when I get to that level that I know I don't know, uh, then I can relax a little bit because I'm in that blank canvas, but usually something comes out of it. And particularly since I've worked with such talented directors, they usually will say something that I can latch on to. Mm. Uh, and and even for instance, you know, let's say with J.J. Abrams, who was, you know, I think he's uh, 17 years younger than I am. We went to the same high school. We had the same English teacher and 17 wow. years apart who taught in a sense existentialism and authenticity and what it was to, to actually try to live a life that was true to yourself. And when it came into the process of creating a character for number seven, The Force Awakens, who would embody the kind of knowledge that, that Yoda would have, but in a new generation, we both thought of Mrs. Gilbert, our teacher, who was 94 at the time, as, a, as a, an example of somebody who had impacted both of us in this teaching guide way. And, and so actually Maz Kanata is actually designed based on 
Mrs. Rose Gilbert, our high school teacher. Really? And and it was it was fascinating that we could both go to that place because she was very strong for both of us at basically identifying where we didn't know things, but making it okay to not know it. And I think that 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 kind of process that JJ has, that Jim Cameron has, Bob Zemeckis, uh, Steven Spielberg, Zack Snyder, that they don't know. And and if you can identify what is not known, then there's a way for that to move forward. And then you eventually, you know it, but that becomes part of the journey of what you didn't know that at the uh, end of the movie, you, you have some understanding of, but to identify early that, that, uh, that you don't necessarily know exactly what you're doing there, how you're going to do it. I don't know. Actually, I don't know of any movie, uh, but most of the movies that I talk with people about, they don't know how they're going to do it. I, I'm very good friends with Dennis Gastner, who we're kind of two people of the same generation who have these parallel careers. We, you know, I was around when he was doing a, a, um, 1917 and, you know, how they were going to do that. It sounds like it's technical and it is, but it's also very um, uh, daunting on just a level of what is it you're trying to accomplish and then to to work that through the process of, of filmmaking, I, I find that to be the the, the single thing that's the most um, exciting is 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 to um, I don't know how to put it. Uh, to, well, have, well, have you ever had in your experience a film that kind of scared you at first, where you thought, "Geez, I really don't know if this is possible." I mean, all all of them, really. I mean, honestly, all I could I could take you through the litany. I I had no idea how we would do Back to the Future two and three back to back and and then do it like a hat trick in that town square of 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 showing you at 1955 1985's alternate and 2015 yeah. but all within one production plus another version that was going to, to have a western town built from scratch somewhere else and a drive in out in mountain and valley that's just the physical side but every single movie uh, for the budgets, the, the the you know Avatar, Jurassic Park, uh, Forrest Gump, uh, Munich because of the location issues and the budget issues, um, I I don't really know how to how to do it other than to forward into the process and and to convey as little fear as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, you know, you, I don't, I don't, but I do acknowledge it so that people who are around me don't feel like they have to be uptight and know too much. Um, and I, then I, of course, I count on them coming through. And because they maybe, like I, have a sense of authorship uh, for the movie itself, if that makes sense. Meaning that they, in their disciplines, feel like they are really contributing and learning something along the way. Where did you start before um, production design? Did you start as an art director or camera uh, operator in, or anything like that? Well, I started, just take a step back from being a traveler. I've always painted and drawn people. So my, I've got a far side eye that, and a near sighted eye. The far side eye is more like the movie work that's out there, backgrounds and worlds. Uh, the right eye is, is for portraits of people. So I was always a painter drawing and when I was traveling. So, uh, so hold on, wait. So you're saying Literally, you have one. Yeah. So, okay. So, so that's it. All right. I thought you were just kind of talking in just general terms about your, you know, the, your sensibilities and the way you approach things. But you actually have one eye that's nearsighted, one eye that's farsighted. Right. So when you talk about like the one eye that's for painting and drawing, like, are you, what do you mean? Are you like covering one? <laughs> are you covering one? Well, or are you, well, what are you in, doing? In turn, inside my head. Yeah. It, it, what happens is I only look at, with one eye at a time. And I, so I don't, I actually can't see 3D in a wow. movie. Wow. So imagine talking with Jim Cameron about the 3D in Avatar, and I don't actually see the three dimension, the third dimension the way they're seeing it. Oh my because God. Because I don't wow. have two points of view on it. However, because that poses a problem, see, most of the situations I've gotten into are to take a deficit and turn it into a positive. And that's what I've tried to do. So with that one in particular, what I realized was I needed to take this deficit 
And I actually associated it with Jake Sully's being a cripple. And I needed to be able to go on a journey in my mind's eye that would allow me to succeed the way he succeeds in the movie to become not only a leader, but to succeed in the battle with the forces that he thought were were uh, conscientiously uh, opposed to uh, his what he thought was right. Hmm. So what I did was I realized that my version of the avatar state that Jake has in the movie is the metaphor for me, meaning I'm a cripple, I can't see 3D, but I'm going to make it so that I have a 3D vision about this movie that is in sync with what it is to go into that MRI type machine and be transferred into another dimension and be able to production design and work with Jim in that whole arena along with Robert Stromberg to actually make it better than it would have been otherwise because I'll contribute on a metaphoric level to the 3D of the movie. And to give you an example of that is it's to recognize and be able to say early on to everybody, the this is a hybrid movie, obviously, but think about it. It's a hybrid movie on a technical level because it's live action and it's digital. Yeah. But it's also a hybrid movie on the content level because it's about a human who goes into another state, a digital state in another dimension, and then actually ends up, in fact, identifying so much with that other state that he decides to relinquish his human state to move on. So that was a kind of, as esoteric as that sounds, that was a real process for me in order to contribute to the movie on a 3D level when I couldn't actually see, per se, the depth that they were talking about that was coming off the screen. But I did understand, for instance, that the first 3D shot that we did, which was the came back, which was where uh, um, Nay Terry has her bow uh, pointed and an arrow pointed on Jake Sully, and she's going to kill him. And when she first sees him, and then she sees something that comes out from the side of the frame, and it lands. It's that wood sprite on the end of her bow, which is a very big 3D moment, and it changes her point of view about him. That means the technical shot of showing 3D in that movie, and the first one that we were looking at with those eyes conveyed the whole message of the movie because it's basically there's Awa entering the movie. And then by the end, she says, Awa has heard you and all that stuff happens in the sky and everything that wins the battle. So the 3D of the movie is an expansive experience for the audience, not just on the on the uh, technical level, but on the emotional content of the movie, the story, what happens. And to identify that as a production designer and lay that out so people could tap into that and understand how at least I saw that and then Jim agreed, then that became things that people could work with. It sounds like, what the hell? I know to people who think, well, I thought you're just supposed to you know, pay, pick the color over here and pick a location here and design a cool prop and maybe a, a, an interesting architecture. But I found that the, the creation of the place of a movie is all the specifics within it, but it's also the overall that you feel by being in it because there are actual ideas in there and it's a visual philosophy that's being conveyed uh, by the movie. And I get to partake in that. In our last couple of minutes, I want to talk about these books that you create for uh, each of you. I don't know if it's for every movie or many of your movies, but um, uh, I saw in a previous interview you've done, uh, you're sort of flipping through these books that are collections of um, you know, stills from the film and then also some of the inspiration pieces. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and when that started for you? Well, once the digital revolution in publishing came, meaning that you could download uh, images and then upload images to create books, uh, I found that it was a way for me to create, uh, in a sense, notebooks going along that, that I didn't try to make them perfect or anything, and they're not even really publishable, but they are a record of my experience, both as an artist, my paintings, I do the same thing with, and my, um, my what I call the moviescape experiences. And I mean, I've put together a, a book now that actually has all the experiences as best as I can put them together, but I'm not probably the writer that I'd like to be 
in order to be able to really convey all these levels. But I do try to do it anyway because it's a record and it's it's, it's something that then you put on your bookshelf and and feel like there's a, a kind of document that that captures at least how I thought at the time. And when I go back to it, I, I usually get something from that, uh, a sense of the overall and, and, the, and where I was at any given moment. And what's included in this book or these books? Uh, well, I, you know, let's say the, the, there's one that says this Oscar sees you. Uh, that was for my uh, avatar experience because mm. that's what I said when I got an Oscar with uh, Robert Stromberg and Kim Sinclair. But what I was saying was to Jim Cameron, because I thought, well, if I'm going to be able to get up there, what am I going to say? And I don't want to say a lot, but I want to make sure he's acknowledged because he was the primary visualist uh, and visionary of the movie. And so I just turned the Oscar towards him. I said, this Oscar sees you. I wanted to acknowledge that. And so all the emails that we sent back and forth and the way the movie uh, was designed, I just put it together in a in a in my own personal uh, sort of scrapbook. Uh, but I wanted to make it about the emotion that I had at the time, uh, which was uh, being uh, able to work with him and and to create that, that world and, and that whole movie. Um, and I've just done that with Steven Spielberg and Bob Zemeckis, and then I try to combine them at times. And, uh, you know, some of them are stills from the internet, other, other things are stills that I've, uh, you know, done myself or collected and um they're just they're like scrapbooks really that that hopefully convey something and i have an archive at usc and so i hope that you know years from now if someone wants to go back and look at how these things were put together not just for my books but the the, i I save a lot of the drawings and videos and files so that maybe if if there is interest you know i don't know 20 years 30 years from now someone can begin to see what it was like because i think when movies are out and they're in the public everybody thinks oh look they're so like together and they are but there's a point at which they're not and then they they have to iteratively step by step be created and that's what i'm trying to convey both to to myself but also you know maybe some people in the future will be interested maybe I, <laughs> I mean, I, I can imagine there's interest at this very moment. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it's fascinating to, it, it would be fascinating to just kind of see that and see it's, it's a, it's a look into your mind in a little, you know, visual journal to the entire production of a film. Like that's incredible. Well, it's, it's pretty overwhelming to me. I, I think most people would just kind of look at it and go, what the hell? I mean, it's a lot. And, and I, I try to leave enough that's a guide through it. So people can, you know, have an understanding. Um, maybe this tell uh, this uh, podcast will have some illumination that somebody will catch, and then, go, if nothing more, be inspired to understand that that movies are a collaborative medium that that a lot of people play a role in, there, and a lot of very thoughtful people uh, who really care about the work that they're doing and feel a sense of of artistic authorship not to the exclusion of anybody else, but in collaboration. Um, and I've gotten to work, you know, in a sense, I've gotten to work with the Beatles, right? I mean, you know, Steven Spielberg, Bob Zemeckis, Jim Cameron, and J.J. Abrams is, you know, that's pretty good. And then, you know, <laughs> that's, Zach, that's it. Zach Snyder in there, exactly. uh, you know, um, as a fifth Beatle. And, you know, I, I think there's something about getting to a certain age, I'm almost 70, where, I can look back and I can see the body of work. I can see my life and how those two are intertwined. And the best I've been able to do is to to identify the journey that it's been that was there from the beginning and still is going forward. And Star Wars in particular is kind of a, I don't know what's after this, because if you think about it, that one's a pretty big finale that actually goes all the way back to 1977, yeah. which is around the time when I was beginning uh, on Hal Ashby movies, so I, I, it, it pretty much encompasses uh, this period, and to want to pass it on and and yet honor the past. What's next for you? I don't know. I, I, uh, um, I, I did a little bit of work on Wicked, and I've handed that uh, to uh, Sarah Greenwood, who is just doing an amazing job. Um, uh, 
making that into a movie that I think a couple of years from now will be just a fantastic movie uh, with Stephen Daldy directing. And I've worked uh, on the Academy Museum in Los Angeles uh, helping with some of the um, exhibitions. Uh, and I'm not really sure what movie is going to be next. Um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what uh, Stephen or Bob or whoever, uh, maybe that's new, um, I get to work with. I love that. No sign of slowing down. And wow, I mean, do you have a portfolio of films here that would just, it's just incredible. It's absolutely stunning. Your work is great and you're worthy of all your success. So thank you for being on Go Creative Show and sharing your experiences. Thank you very much. Wow. What an honor to have Rick Carter on the show, legendary production designer. We're so happy to have him here, right? I mean, it's amazing. When you think about what this guy has worked on in his career, it is just mind blowing. And I'm always so humbled and thankful when, you know, people like that at his level come on here and talk about their stuff right here in the Go Creative Show. It's, it's just so fun to have, uh, you know, to have those types of experiences uh, shared on the show. I hope you guys like it. So please let us know what you think by going to Go Creative Show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And giving us some feedback. Let us know what you think. And if you have any guest suggestions, we'd love to hear that too. I also want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, who puts this show together and does a ton of behind the scenes work to make it all happen. You can follow him at ignitionvisuals.com, ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, Matt Russell for mixing, mastering, and making the show sound so good. Find him at gainstructure.com, at gainstructure. And of course, you should be following me too, because my Instagram is filled with behind the scenes uh, stories and photos from shoots that I'm on. This week alone, I did a shoot for, um, a two day shoot for Honda Dealers of New England. So we've got a ton of behind the scenes there in my Instagram stories. You guys are going to absolutely love it. I've been having a lot of fun doing it. And uh, you get to see what I've been working on uh, when I'm not doing Go Creative Show. It's all there on uh, Instagram at Ben Consoli. All right, guys. Please remember to support our sponsors, Rule Boston Camera and Post Lab. Without them, the show won't exist. So please support those that support us. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.